Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I hope uh, we're all doing well this Thursday morning. I am. I'm excited to be here with all of you guys, and so I figured I would jump into what we're doing today. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about, I, I think something like this can be sometimes contentious, but I'm hoping the way I talk about it today uh, won't be. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping not, uh, but you never know. So if I end up insulting anyone, uh, just uh, know that I I don't desire to do that. <laughs> so I'm just going to get this set up real quick. I forgot to pull up maybe the most important thing. All right, there we go. Uh, well, not the most important thing, but um, yeah, uh, an important one nonetheless. So I came across this article from First Things. First Things is a journal about religion in the United States from a lot of different people who uh, who write uh, from for it. I will say it comes from tech, from usually from Christian perspective, maybe even a Catholic perspective most of the time, but technically. Lots of different, um, lots of different religious people write for first things. It's pretty interesting. Definitely worth checking out if you're one of those people that likes to read things. Although it definitely tends to be, like, if you're looking for, like, what type of style of writing. Like, if you think of, like, New Yorker as, like, long form, you know, hot hoity-toity journalism. And then, like, The Sun <laughs> at the other end. First things is closer to the New Yorker uh side of things but in any case i came across this great article called the church of england and cost free righteousness and it's not long you know a few paragraphs here and it's by carl truman who i think is a really good uh writer and uh and professor uh i've read a few of his books it's really good stuff um he wrote this article as a commentary on another article that was written which i can't show you not because there's any problem with it it seems interesting it's just paywalled and uh, i don't live in the uk i don't read the spectator so i'm not going to pay for the spectator but what i did here is i checked i just checked it to, to go into the actual article itself um so this is all about an initiative that the church of england is doing uh which is the state church of the united kingdom and it's the anglican church maybe you've heard that term before uh, this is the Anglican Church, as in the the kind of the head mother church for all the other Anglican churches in the world. So, uh, you know, in the United States, that's like the ACNA and the Episcopal Church kind of root themselves back to the Anglican Church. You have um, all sorts of churches in, in the various places of what used to be the British Empire, usually considered like the, the Church of Ireland, for example, is the Irish version of this that still maintain connections they're in communion is what we call it um you have church churches you know I, i'm sure everywhere um throughout the uh the whole of uh, of the what used to be the british empire and that's actually really related to what this is about so the church of england published this report right here uh it's the oversight group and recommendations uh, it's called uh, Healing, Repair, and Justice. And basically what this is, and I'm going to link this in the comments, so you do not have to take my word for it. You can go down there. You can read it yourself. It's free online. Um, it's about a fund. I'm scrolling down because I want to get to a certain part, uh, which Truman highlights in his article. But it, it, it gets to a certain – it's about a fund that is in response. So back in the 1700s, there was this fund that Queen Anne – set up uh it was called queen anne's bounty i learned all this in the report by the way i don't just know this information and it was a fund that was set up to help poor clergy so basically from what i understand is it would help to subsidize them and things like that a good thing right i think all of us can agree that in in places where um it's it, it's tough for ministers to get paid uh that we should try and as a church make and make a way to make sure that they are able to you know not that they're you know millionaires or whatever but it be able to live and not have to str to struggle or, or work like outside of what they have to do i mean i think that's good but i guess i'm a clergy person right so and perfect role for something like the broader denomination or church to do but 
when this fund was set up, it was used as an investment fund like many other things, right? You set up a fund, you have it invest in, in various things in order to keep itself going. And one of the things that this invested in in 1707 or whenever it came out was the slave trade, right? And so the Church of England has done a report and uh, they, well, these people did a report and they said, well, this is bad, um, which I don't disagree with necessarily. And they said, um, well, let's, uh, you know, let's make a new fund to kind of repair that damage. And I think when presented like that, it's fine. But there are things in it that I find a little difficult and a little um, wrong theologically, uh, kind of disrespectful to the history of Christianity in Africa, um, the role of missionaries that was played there. Uh, and also the role of present day Africans in the church and kind of how I think the way that they talk about that in this report, um, is n unhelpful and really comes from a very, I, funnily enough, um, imperialist <laughs> or colonialist, uh, view, um, which they wouldn't you know, we would normally expect. So first of all, this type of report that the Church of England does right here is extremely common. Um, this is uh, something that lots of institutions have been doing. Uh, Princeton Theological Seminary did this when I was there. I was actually uh, one of the researchers uh, on that one. Um, now, I should, by researchers, I mean, I helped the professors who, who did it. All right, I wasn't, like, I was like the guy who like found notes for them and stuff. Um, but it was pretty interesting. And, um, and so, but like lots of things do this. Like you can just go up like to like reparations reports and stuff like that. Lots of universities and other institutions have done this. I believe the Peace USA, our denomination is in the middle of it or has done it already. It, it, like it's not a surprise, that type of thing. Right. Um, and I could use this as a time to talk about whether or not I actually think those are good. However, I I don't really want to talk about that. Like, is it helpful? Is it unhelpful? I, I don't really want to go into those waters because really I haven't done enough research to, to really know outside of like gut reactions a lot of the time. Um, but what I will say is I do think we need to care about the theology behind why we do it, right? Um, especially in Christian circles. And we want to talk about it in ways that I think are helpful and not in ways that are unhelpful. And this is uh, this comes from the Church of England. Basically, it's going to fund, it's going to invest in certain communities and things like that. I don't think it's supposed to be a return on investment, um, but it's 100, 100 million pounds, which is a lot of money, um, and that's where it's going. Now, of course, in the whole assets of the Church of England, I, I don't know how much that is, but I imagine that they're going to be all right. I don't think that that's... A huge 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 amount um for them i think they're pretty wealthy as a as a whole um but uh that's what they're doing and one of the things that i i worry about and <laughs> is that it's it's not is is it comes out of a of a of a place that is not formed by biblical thinking but rather by other types of thinking um so, for instance, uh, the, the, the letter for their report or the, the, the theological thing that they use is Isaiah 58. That's what I have here. It's a great, great passage, uh, especially for, um, I think we read this on, on Ash Wednesday, but on Ash Wednesday, both the texts we're looking at today are actually Ash Wednesday texts. Um, true, true fasting. And so this is what God says. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want you to get get the point across so it says shout it aloud and do not hold back raise your voice like a trumpet declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of jacob their sins for day after day they seek me out they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its god they ask me for just decisions and seem eager for god to come near them why have we fasted they say and you have not seen it why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed Yet on the day of your fasting you do as you please, and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. 
You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. It goes on and on, right? So the problem is, is that the people are doing performative things, and this is where it becomes kind of interesting for this report, becomes performative, um, but their hearts aren't actually changed into following what God is calling them to do. And one of the things the report really focuses on here is in 12, right, where it says, he says, if you, like, follow me the way you're supposed to, you'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will build the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings, right? So they call it their, like, repair of the, of the broken walls thing. Repairer of the breach. That's that's the term terminology the Church of England uses in their report to talk about this fund being like a repairer of the breach, right? To fill in the gap that was broken. And I do think that like this type of thing can do that. Um, I also want to talk about Matthew 6 real quick though. So this is also important. Um, again, I can't, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you, you should. Matthew 6 is, is great. We read this for... Again, for Ash Wednesday this year. Um, I think it's like the, this typical reading. I mean, I'll just read the first little bit here about when Jesus is giving to the needy. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, I can imagine some people who are critical of the Church of England's report would say, well, see, they're publicizing it. They're talking about it. This is just what Jesus is taking. I think that's a little unfair because, I mean, like, with this amount of money, you have to talk about it and you have to let people know. I imagine this is this is something that the actual – commissioners need to vote on i don't think it's technically been approved yet but i think it will be um i i think like you you have you can talk about it it's, it's how you present it and i don't think the church of england in this report necessarily presents it as a like look how good and righteous we are for doing such a thing the problem with the report um is in some ways it's not that it comes out saying something like that, but it's the way that it talks about righteousness or repair or the history and work of the church in Africa that I have a, a problem with. And I think ends up falling into, ironically, the problem that God was talking about in Isaiah 58 and the problem that Jesus is getting at when he talks about the heart in Matthew 6. So let's actually take a look at the part I'm talking about. So it's a huge report has mostly most of it has to do with like how the fund is going to work um i'm not really a good judge of that sort of thing but what i can judge is the theology and ethics section which is just these three little areas right um and i really want to focus on penitence because that's really what these two passages are about and uh and how and what this report says i actually want to zoom in a little bit more so for those of you who who uh, can't see it as well. There we go. All right, let me make sure I'm not blocking it. All right, excellent. So you'll see right here, it says penitence. So this is like their why they do this or the theology they wanna have with the fund type of thing. It says, we call for the Church of England to apologize publicly for denying that black Africans are made in the image of God and for seeking to destroy diverse African traditional religious belief systems. Now here's the thing, I am not going to sit here and 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 uh, be an apologetic for colonialism or anything like that, right? I'm not going to say, oh, it was good or empire is good uh, and all these type of things because there absolutely was during the 18 and 1900s, uh, 1700s, I guess for a long time, right? Going back to the 16, 1500s. All right, you get what I'm saying. There has always been on the part of empires oppression of the people that they come across and this is just true for all of human history it's not as though this was particularly true of european uh nat nations um you know i mean it's funny you can just go to east asia and go to the people around china not even today but like 
back in history and they have a very uh, different view of China or a very negative view of China for the old imperial dynasties and modern China always trying to take over different places. This is just the natural world, the, the how humans naturally, naturally work. Daniel actually has really, the, the prophecies of Daniel actually talk about this a little bit with the beasts and things like that. But all this is just to say is, so I'm not going to defend that. I think a lot of those abuses are wrong and incorrect. For me, it's it's hard for, to say just broad strokes, everything is wrong, like because that, that's not true about anything um, or almost anything, I should say. Obviously, sinful things are obviously wrong. But even God in, his, in sin uses that to create good, like Joseph um when he's sold into slavery and goes through all that sort of stuff right so i can't just say that there's nothing irredeemable about anything because that's just not how the bible presents the issue to me um but i mean i think it's good that they're saying that they start off strong it's one of these sentences where the first thing is okay is like yeah this is something that we should definitely speak out against right that black people although i don't really like that term right but you get what i'm saying africans people from africa really everyone are all made in the image of god and any time in history that that's been denied or not used or not understood is sinful and wrong uh, a thousand percent right my second problem but my problem with this sentence is at the end so the church of england needs to apologize for denying that black people are made in the image of god which is true they should apologize for that i mean again how apologetic can you be for something that happened a while ago is tough to figure out but sure um reaff maybe affirming that might be a better thing than apologizing but in any case it says and for seeking to destroy diverse african traditional religious belief systems that's my problem so here's the thing that and this is a big problem especially for uh the progressive churches who tend to be the ones with a lot of the money and the power um, in a lot of the Western countries that have benefited from colonialism or or, uh, or or empire or just the Industrial Revolution, whatever you want to call it, is that they they don't understand necessarily, they, they can't really wrap their minds around the idea that maybe going on missions and getting people out of some of these traditional religious belief systems is a good thing. And I think that is a good thing. <laughs> I will put my, uh, I'm very pro missions. I'm very pro going to places and getting rid of bad beliefs. Um, in his article, Truman talks about how in Nigeria they would do twin infanticide or um, uh, where they would kill both twins out of religious obligation. Um, you know, one, another practice that's often pointed out is Sati in India. When the missionaries went to India, there was this process where you would burn a widow like if the husband died, you would then burn her. Um, obviously, with the missions in the United States or in the Americas, right, coming and seeing people cutting out hearts and stuff like that. And I want to be clear that this isn't a racial thing. It's often here viewed through that lens, but incorrect, right? Because this is the same type of thing was going on in Europe when the first Christian missionaries showed up, like among the Celts and among the Germans and the Scandinavians and stuff like that, and among the the Lithuanians, all right, and the Slavs. They were all doing stuff like this too. It has nothing to do with skin color or whoever's better than everyone else. The natural state of humanity is to do these pretty terrible things. I mean, even in the Old Testament, right, the people around Israel are sacrificing their children. So it's not at all a, a racial thing, or it shouldn't be. And we should, as a church, affirm that, you know what? Uh, yes, the way that some Christians in the past, the missionaries have acted is wrong, and people have definitely abused the church in order to abuse other people a thousand percent sinful evil we hope god judges them eternally for it at the same time there are faithful christians who have done good work in communities throughout the uh throughout the world uh whether as part of imperial projects or not um and have have made people's lives extremely better and i think anyone who is aware of that and i actually think africans are some of the people that are most aware of this uh, at least the ones that that i've spoken to um, where they've seen and still see some of these traditional beliefs going on um and, and have also seen in their ancestors like their direct ancestors who converted the price that is often paid for going against that so anyway it goes on right 
And it says this act of repair should intentionally facilitate ongoing and new sociological, historical, and theological research into spiritual traditions in Africa and the diaspora, thereby enabling a fresh dialogue between African traditional belief systems and the gospel. And I don't, I don't think this is, depending on what you mean by this, this can't, be necessarily wrong, right? Because all cultures that I've found in my life, every single culture has positives and negatives. And I believe it's the job of people who bring the gospel into the culture to highlight where the gospel and the culture agree to show that yes, like what you care about is found in Christ and that good root is part of the universal grace that God has given us, the law in our hearts. But it also should call out the negative parts of the culture, right? Um, and I think you see this happen in the Gospels quite a bit, actually, when, not the Gospels, but the, the Acts and Paul's letters, when he talks about, like, Greco-Roman culture, he doesn't necessarily say all of it's wrong, but he does call out parts of it that, that are. And I think that that's generally how we should go about how we do this, right? So what this shouldn't look like um, is it shouldn't look like uh, just saying, well, all of the normal or are all the traditional African religious beliefs are good and fine, uh, which is not the case. Uh, I, again, they don't say that here, but with that first sentence, I'm a little worried about, I'm worried about that, right? That it's, it's almost as though they don't really care about um, the idea that, that the gospel should radically transform uh, a society. Basically what Isaiah is saying in, in his and, and Jesus is saying there is it should change hearts. And so you drop a lot of the outward things that you're doing and actually start doing what God wants you to do. That's what we should hope happens in cultures where the gospel is brought in, including here in the United States. It says this work should reach beyond theological institutions and be pre presented in ways that will enable all Africans, especially descendants of the enslaved to discover the varied belief systems and spiritual practices of their forebears and their efficacy. So the interesting thing here is this is presented as a thing for all Africans, but really what this is for, from what I understand, is for people who are in diaspora communities. So people who are taken out of, you know, people that were enslaved, taken out of Africa, West Africa, uh, I'd imagine, um, and brought to other places, probably the UK, in particular, I mean, they didn't really go to the UK, but many of them later settled there. It's a whole history. Um, and that's where the fund's going to be dispersed. I don't think that this is going to be dispersed really in Africa, uh, which is probably the place that actually needs it the most. <laughs> um, but that's that's not really my place to judge. I mean, you know, I, I understand these things are multifaceted. And I, didn't, I haven't read the whole report. I also don't know, um, you know, what I'm talking about. So... All I'm saying is, though, that um, it's it's about helping them to understand the varied belief systems and spiritual practices of their forebears and their efficacy. And it's like some of them might have been efficacious. That like that means effective for good things generally, right? But like, let's not sit here and pretend. Like, imagine if I were to say, you know what? Uh, I guess I can't do this because the Presbyterian Church wasn't around at the time. But let's just say that the, you know, Christians need to apologize to the Germanic people for the Holy Roman Empire, right? When Charlemagne went in and killed a bunch of them and forcefully converted some of them, uh, and also for you know the the missions that were sent to Scandinavia and Germany and things like that, and. On top of all this, like, we need German people to understand how great and awesome their old religious beliefs were when they would tie people to rocks and, like, cut their hearts out um, or, uh, you know, burn women alive after their husbands died, which is also something that Scandinavians did. It wasn't just – it's a pretty common thing that people would do that, right? Or kill slaves or to, to, to sacrifice to the gods and all such sort of stuff like this, right? I think it ends up leading to a very sanitized – patronizing and dare I say colonial view of people's traditional belief systems uh, when we simply broad brush stroke them and say, well, actually they're in complete uh, harmony with Christian faith, right? And that they're just as efficacious as the gospel. Um, and then it says, and now you could say, well, no, it just means like African view 
of Christianity, which I think is fine. No problem with. You could say that, but then they finally, they kind of undercut that with their final sentence. It says, we recommend the commissioners work with all faith-based communities to which descendants of African chattel enslavement belong. So it's this idea that like all these different faiths are just as equal and, and will be getting parts of this fund, right? And to me, that's kind of the problem. And the reason I think that this is a problem is because it takes this universalist tone, which is very common in the West right now, to say all of these belief systems are exactly the same and applies it into a context where that isn't really true. I actually think some of the Christians that know this best are African Christians who are on the front lines. And I think that this is actually um, pretty disrespectful towards the mission work that goes on now, which is largely taken up by Africans right in Africa. So going to these other tribes uh, who still hold to these traditional systems or going to Muslims and the amount of people who die doing this is not insignificant and hasn't been insignificant in the past, you know, 200 years. There are martyrs in Africa who, where this happens all the time. And I think that like to say, just to say like, oh, we need to apologize for trying to change people's belief systems. It just completely is wrongheaded and not in the spirit of what Isaiah is talking about. I do. I think that funds like this are inherently wrong. No. Right. So it's not my it's not the thing that's happening, although I think that this is something that Isaiah is warning against, because based on the reasoning, the theology behind it, which is what I'm focusing on, is it's performative. Right. It's not heart changing is it's performative. It's let's give people a lot of money and then like but we're not actually going to change anyone's hearts or try and call people to worship God. What we're doing is we're giving 100 million pounds i keep wanting to say 100 million dollars 100 million pounds to just this idea of of something that we think will be you know will, will help make the world more equitable but in reality right that's not what god is calling us to do in in, in isaiah 58 or matthew 6 right I, I god is calling us to to change our hearts to a point where we desire what he desires um not doing things performatively and that's really Truman's point in his article. So I'm not going to harp on that too much. I mostly wanted to talk about this idea of, of penitence and, and um, this history and things like that that I think is really important to highlight when it comes to how we view religion in the world. Because in a way, right, this is meant to repair damage caused by colonialism, but in its assumptions – it's again just telling people in Africa or telling people that have worked there, right? That no, like, you know, what you like this whole one religion thing, only one thing is true. That's so outdated. Um, and really, like, we're sorry for, for you guys having this faith that you think is really important. Um, you know, we think that that's, that's our bad. You guys can, can still. You guys should still be worshiping whatever gods or spirits or whatever you worshiped before we showed up. We're sorry, which is not the Christian response, right? Um, it should be like, we're sorry that, and we wish to condemn all of the bad stuff that happened, right? All the stuff that where, where it was very abusive and non-Christ-like, but they shouldn't apologize for doing what in some cases was the right thing to do, which is leading people to the truth. So it's all so messed up. Um, and this is kind of the, the problem that our culture finds itself in generally is that we just are so stuck in, in, in these political or cultural battles that we often forget kind of where we're at. One of the funny things is even about this is you could say this is even actually American cultural imperialism because this all starts in the U.S. and then other Western countries begin to copy it. Which is why, like, this actually is kind of old to me because a lot of this was being done in the 2010s. Um, and now the Church of England is just doing it. So it's just this weird, weird strain of, 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 of cultural imperialism, colonial imperialism, or col colonial culturalism, whatever you want to call it, um, that goes throughout. So all this is to say is, like, why does this matter for you as a Christian, right? Why does this matter outside of this just being an interesting thing? The reason this matters is because in our lives, right, we are constantly tempted to do performative righteousness. We are constantly tempted to say or do things that 
don't really require us to change or really don't challenge us that much, right? It's easier. This is the, the classic thing for me is something very similar to this, right? If there's a problem, it's easier just to throw money at it. Or if you've done something wrong, it's easier just to, you know, just say you're sorry and then get get out of it without having to do any actual work on your heart, right? You're just like, all right, I'll pay something. I'll say I'm sorry. I'll do whatever. And what the text of Isaiah and Matthew call us to do is to not do that, right? When we are fasting, when we are praying, when we are trying to, to do what, what God wants us to do, it's to actually get in there and do it ourselves, right? To actually bring about repair of souls and repair the world ourselves. And that's so costly and so time consuming and so difficult that oftentimes we don't want to do it. And so it's easier to just fall into the patterns of our culture, do what we need to do in order to repair the damage and then move on. But I think it starts really with what Isaiah, what God is saying through, through the prophet Isaiah, where he says, you know, you can't do that and then expect to see change or good blessings or anything like that, right? That comes from understanding what God desires you to do. And so you can't just say you're sorry and think everything's better, but what really happens is you first need to understand what God desires you to do and then do those things, and then you'll see blessings flow from that. I'm not saying that you're going to get a bunch of money or whatever, but what I am saying is that you're definitely going to understand what God is calling you to do uh, more, and because of that, your life will be enhanced and rich. Um, if not in material, then spiritually, which matters a lot more. So all that is uh, what I wanted to talk about today. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. I will see you on Sunday for worship. Peace out.